Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you all. Keith from the Faculty Development Team. Uh, welcome to the 2013-14 season of Primetime Library. Primetime is a collaborative project between uh, friends of the BB Library, faculty development, and many other offices on campus, celebrating learning beyond the classroom through the experiences and accomplishments of the faculty, students, and staff. Primetime schedule is filling in. If you'd like to see what's coming up, check out the homepage of the new library website where our events will be listed. On Tuesday, October 15th, new faculty member Jay Milbrandt will present Rediscovering David Livingston, Exile, African Slavery, and the Publicity Stunt that saved you. Today we welcome Dr. Chris Gibbs. Uh, we will present Pietism from the High Sierra to the Song. Song. <laughs> Holistic Education in the Ecclesiola. Ecclesiola of off campus study. I'm glad you're standing right there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's welcome Chris. Um, first of all, I'll explain the bait and switch that took place. Uh, David Williams was supposed to be part of this talk, and I know that we're going to the e announcements. Uh, we decided not to do it this way. Um, to explain a little bit of background, uh, this is part of the series of talks we're going to preview our forthcoming book, Whole and Holy Persons, a pietist approach to Christian higher education. And uh, David was one of the speakers who came back. He's a former student at Bethel, a longtime philosophy professor, now teaching at Azusa Pacific University. He came back in June to speak for our workshop, and the two of us were going to write a chapter with something like this title in the High Sierra part was David's piece. We will say less about the song, which is my piece. Um, However, as David and I worked on this, David wrote up this like 6,000 page, essentially like prolegomena, presuppositions of what teaching looks like, what community looks like, and, and David, this is much better than anything we're going to write. This needs to be part of the book instead. So we decided um, that David is going to come back separately. He told me it would be sometime on December 12th or 13th. He's going back to do some hunting with his brother and swing up here to maybe give a talk. So you'll get the benefit of David Williams at some point. But we thought this was on the schedule. We'll go ahead and do it, partly because this is a way to preview some of uh, what David would talk about, but I think other elements here would work their way into the book, in other contributors' chapters, or in my conclusion, perhaps, as I think about some practical applications for the future of a pietist college. So, pietism from the highest here into the sum, holistic education, the ecclesiola of off-campus study. And as with apparently all of my talks, we start with Carl Lundquist. Uh, this is this is the long-serving president of the university, sometime in the mid-1970s, looking just a little bit older than he did in 1954 when he became president of Bethel College and Seminary. By 1976, he had accomplished one of his chief goals as president, which was to move to a larger campus. This is uh, the new Arden Hills campus sometime in the 1970s from a very excellent and growing digital library collection that uh, kids and others in Fletcher are working with. Uh, in 1976, Carl, I think, was tired, it's fair to say, after 24 years of service, 22 years of service and um, working on this, which was still a problem. Um, he asked the Board of Regents for a sabbatical. And he was granted six months to do a pretty remarkable and tiring, I think, but renewing sabbatical. He traveled 50,000 miles visiting different centers of Christian spiritual renewal, he called them. So it included 43 sites. So it started in the United States, March 20, 1976. Each little blue thing is a Google map location of where he visited. He started in Peoria, Arizona at a Franciscan retreat center, went to another Catholic community in Phoenix, and then on from there. So I just highlighted a few. Uh, Camp Tillicum had recently been purchased by George Fox College in 1975. Um, and actually, it was recently, just a couple of years ago, George Fox ceded it back to the Society of Friends. It's used more as a church camp now. But it was uh, a kind of wilderness retreat, not too far from where Oregon Extension is. Uh, he also went to Lady Lodge, which is the, the famous retreat center in the middle of, te in the, middle of the Texas uh, ranch country. Went to Spring Church, which was a relatively new retreat center in uh, Maryland, just outside the nation's capital. But not all of them were retreats in that sense. He went to Faith at Work in suburban Chicago, which dealt with uh, helping professionals think through their vocation. North Park College, as Carl Olson had just come to work for Faith at Work at that point. Um, he went to uh, Bergamo Center in Dayton, Ohio, which is the largest retreat center in the country, run by the Marian Brothers, a Catholic religious order at that point. So great ecumenical trip, included monasteries, retreat centers, other kinds of sites. Then he went to Europe and uh, traveled about 30,000 miles in Europe. He started in Rome 
went to CC to an ecumenical center, uh, went to the Tizé community in France, and then to Switzerland, where he talked with Francis Schaefer at Labrie, and then he went to YWAM at Lausanne, went to Schloss Müttersil in Austria, which continues to have public connections to this day. Several sites in West Germany, I don't know if Jay was there at that point or not, but he was in West Germany, and then ended in the British Isles. Uh, so a variety of sites, including the Keswick Conve Convention, which deeply influenced uh, Lundquist's view of Christian holiness, and then the ancient monastery at Iona, the abbey off the coast of Scotland. And then he went to visit Baptists in Russia, and he went to Singapore, and he went to an evangelical gathering in Australia, and then somehow stopped at Fiji and Hawaii on the way back to the United States. And it's not a bad sabbatical. It's been a really good sabbatical video at Factory Retreat if they did that back in the day. Um, so why am I mentioning all this? What does this have to do with pietism or off-campus study? So, um, by the way, this is the report he wrote in November of 1976. It's in the seminary library if you want to read it. He also published a condensed version of it in Christianity Today a year or two later. The focus less on what I'm going to talk about, but more on Christian rule and how these kinds of centers are useful for it. But he thought there's an academic application to all of this. So his proposal had started with the, with the question, if uh, some variant of a retreat center could be incorporated helpfully into the life of an academic community, stimulate a devotional growth in the life of students that would parallel and give focus to their intellectual growth. Um, for at least a few years before this, Carl and sometimes Nancy as well have been teaching a one credit class on Christian devotion in the seminary. I was working with the seminary curriculum their spiritual formation. But he wondered, could this be done for the college? Could you actually build a retreat experience into the college curriculum? We'll talk about why he was so concerned about that. But he came back feeling that, yes, this could be done. He recommended Bethel acquire at least a 100-acre site, develop a spiritual retreat center at least an hour from campus, where, depending on how you timed it, but like 3,000 students annually could cycle through for, he recommended, two-day retreats. That you would actually build that into the Gen Ed curriculum. This would be part of the Bethel College and Seminary experience. But there could also be other versions of J-Term experience, for example. Um, you may have noticed we do not have a Bethel Spiritual Retreat Center unless I've missed it on the maps all these years. Um, I, I don't know why, I can suspect, and Lundquist even offered the suggestion kind of knowing it wouldn't happen. He wrote, it is clear at Bethel that such a project would rank low on other priorities until the academic and residential units called for in the present building program are completed. And they never will. Uh, even later, such a site could be secured only if a donor with special interest were to appear. And even then, some endowment provision would need to be included to prevent charges restricting full student use. We wanted to make this accessible to students. Um, we had not seen the Brush Harbor papers yet, so I don't know what became of this, but uh, you know, Carl left in 1982, not too long after Bethel entered a pretty deep economic crisis, and I suspect this sank on the list of priorities and never came to be. And, and so that, you know, as a historian of Bethel, this is kind of interesting. This is out there. But as someone who's also taught a little bit off campus, and knowing that this has become a pretty important part of the Bethel experience to go off campus, whether it's in this country or beyond, suggested that maybe there's some connections. In some way, maybe the spirit of this has prevailed in off-campus study being such an essential part of the Bethel experience for so many of our students. And I think there are at least three ways to think about this. One has really nothing to do with pietism by the time I start here, um, which is to think about this as, what's the purpose of retreat? If you go up to the Bethel Seminary Library, the Carl H. Lundquist Bethel Seminary Library, you go downstairs, there's a room called the Flame Room. It has Dale Johnson's image of the burning heart. So after Carl retired, he founded this evangelical order of the burning heart to promote spiritual disciplines. And he had this huge collection of Christian spirituality literature, including 18 books that come them, on spiritual retreat. One of which is from 1967. It's called The Call to Adventure, The Retreat as Religious Experience, edited by Raven McGee. It's an ecumenical collection. And one chapter on extended retreat comes from Bill McNamara. It was a rather eccentric uh, Carmelite monk who in 1960 founded the Spiritual Life Institute in the deserts of northern Arizona, which is still around. Uh, Carl didn't visit. He was about two hours away from it. He didn't go there. But I like to think that he read McNamara's chapter, because McNamara starts by saying, what about the modern life separates us from God? As a prelude to think about retreat. And one thing he said is that above all, we miss God in our education. The goal of which is supposed to be contemplation, according to Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and the fathers of the church, Thomas Aquinas, and all other ancient and modern educators worth listening to. The word, <laughs> word school comes from the Greek word skola, which means leisure. Dan Ritchie should be up here talking about this, but I'll, I'll play the role. 
And so in some ways, education is the problem. This creates the need for retreat. Because instead, the, I mean, the Greek schools provide the opportunity and establish disciplinary for contemplation. Today, the schools have expelled leisure. And American students, after 16 to 20 years of schooling, have never learned to cultivate the attitudes and predispositions needed for contemplation. And so in a sense, it's important to think about that retreat serves to separate us from education as it's generally understood in modernity and especially in this society. We actually need retreats because of education. But is there a way to think about education itself as providing a retreat? And, and here I'm struck by why McNamara says it's important to go to the desert in broad terms. The desert evokes a man's latent capacity for initiative, exploration, evaluation. It interrupts his ordinary pattern of life. It intercepts the stultifying process of a conventional routine piety. It disengages him from the regular round of respectable human activities. Man learns to be still, alert, perceptive, recollected, so that issues become clear. Reality becomes recognizable and unambiguous. He knows God, not abstractions about God, not even the theology of God, but the much more mysterious and mighty God of theology, the God of Abraham, of Moses, Elias, or Peter, Paul, and John, of the fathers of the desert, the God of saints, and the God of sinners. And I think broadly, Christian liberal arts can do this. I want to come back to that theme. But maybe it's important to build in something even a little bit more separated as part of the experience. That maybe, wonderful I think as our curriculum or programs are, they can become stultifying. They can become programmed. And we need to interrupt that somehow and displace ourselves from that if we're to actually get at this leisure and contemplation that he talks about. So I think that's the broad principle of why retreat and education really belong together and what Lundquist is getting at. And one way to do this, I think that probably can be for us, is to go off campus, to get away from the place where we've built up our structures and our habits and our patterns. And maybe this is going to the desert, to the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. So I mentioned David. There he is. Um, David uh, left Bethel to go to the High Sierra program, which is not taught at Azusa's main campus, but is taught off in the wilderness. It's a great books program, but it also has things like rock climbing. Um, and it's intentionally a retreat experience for a semester, in which you do this very, you know, kind of like Western humanities in a sense. So you're doing it in a group of about 25, cut off from civilization. And, and so you know, think of all the things McNamara says are supposed to happen on a retreat. Well, this is what David does semester by semester for Azusa. And I think this is very much in the spirit of Paul Lundquist. I ran into David at a church about six years ago when he came back for a visit. And I just seen this and I said, you should write a paper about this. And so it took seven years to Germany. But I, mean, I immediately thought of him when I, when I read this report. And I think we do things like this that, that take our students to wildernesses of a sort. I think of going to the Galapagos is a pretty obvious example in some ways. What Christina does to go to Cambodia probably fits this. But even those of us who go to places like Western Europe go to deserts, if only spiritual or intellectual deserts. Um, this is an image from the German Military Cemetery of Weimar, where Sam and I took 12 students last January. It's just outside the town of Ypres, which is one of the worst battle sites in World War I. And this is where about 40,000 German soldiers are buried. And I didn't think of it as a spiritual retreat at the time. But in retrospect, if you enter Langemark, you cross the river Styx. There's actually a moat you cross, and there's a sense of descending to Hades. This is built into the architecture of the place. Everything brings your attention down, probably because the rules the Allies inflicted on the Germans. Um, I didn't think of St. Anthony of the Desert at that point, but I do now. But St. Anthony, the original Desert Father, not only went to the wilderness, but he went to a tomb to encounter God, to do spiritual warfare. There's a sense in which this is going to that tomb. And so I think generally what we did was a kind of retreat, even though we were in pretty familiar modern sorts of cities, but especially in our two and a half days from battlefields and sacred places like cemeteries, memorial spaces, this was our way, I think, of going to the desert and doing what McNamara suggested. This did interrupt our ordinary patterns of life. It intercepted a stultifying conventional routine piety and disengaged us in the regular round. It's an unforgettable experience. I should have Sam talk about it because he's more eloquent about why In any case, what does this have to do with pietism, then? And here I would revisit Lundquist's report because I think he suggested two really important principles of renewal that are evidently pietistic. And they go all the way back to the 1670s in Germany, to people like Schweiner and Franke and Johanna Peterson, and all the others that you heard Sarah and Marion talk about on Tuesday. And pietism, if nothing else, is about the experience of new birth and new life. 
Yeah. And so it's, it's just flush with language of renewal and revitalization you know, and, and these very organic metaphors of you know, birth and life flourishing. And so I think Lundquist in his report picks up on these as he had throughout most of his career. And first, you know, how does the individual experience this renewal? And not just in their mind, which is what you think a college would focus on, but in their emotions, in their loves. Uh, in what they do with their hands and their feet and their skills. I mean, how does the whole person experience renewal? And Pietists, contrary to this, the stereotype, are not individualists. They also are concerned about renewal beyond the, the atomized individuals that modernity produces. They're concerned, first and foremost, about renewing the church, and then through that society, which I won't talk about here, but my company quarterly article talks about. And their model of this is the ecclesiola, the little church within the church. And so I want to suggest that these kinds of experiences serve as ecclesiology and then renew the church, not just the individual. So first of all, how does this renew the whole person? And that's just a classic theme running through Lundquist. So I'll start with the sabbatical report, then revisit a couple of earlier passages. But in the beginning of the sabbatical report, this is how he framed the problem he was trying to solve. Too often, it has seemed to me the student world of the post-1960s has been characterized by extreme polarization of uncritical piety on one hand and sterile intellectualism on the other. This is not a new problem, of course, but evangelical college and seminary, all institutions, ought to be able to bring these two polarities together. Happily, I believe that under God that is taking place at Bethel, but as president, I keep wondering if we can do it better. Can we learn anything from the renewal movement as a result of its concern to relate Christian faith to everyday life, when that everyday life consists basically of academic pursuits? He's, he's concerned about secularization uh, and drift in American society away from God. He's also concerned that we set up this, this forced choice between spiritual formation and intellectual formation. He wants to say you do both at a Christian college. In his, uh, I think, his third annual report, Bethel's interest in the development of the total personality, not just the intellect. There must be no compromise with the latter, but we feel also there must be no neglect of the former. Spiritual emphasis cannot be confined to a department of Christianity. It must permeate the entire campus. And then, seven years later, it is difficult to see life whole with man's intellectual labor and his Christian dedication as consistent facets of a single person. Man's first love includes both heart and mind, and at points, these merge into one another indistinguishably. The Christian heart lifts all of life to the level of the sacred, so that nothing, including intellectual labor, is really secular. The Christian mind, on the other hand, finds the most meaningful integration of all truth in God as ultimate truth, and thus his intellectual work becomes a deeply religious experience. Who is to say, therefore, where the intellectual leaves off and the spiritual begins? Part of this uh, last week in CWC, Sarah Shady was talking about scholasticism, and started with this prayer by Thomas Aquinas, and asked students, have you ever thought of what you're doing in this class? Have you ever prayed before homework? Have you prayed before taking notes? Have you thought of this as your act of spiritual worship, which is pleasing to God? And then brings about what Romans 12, 2 says, the renewing of not being conformed, but renewing. I think it was a really powerful moment. We were talking the other day. It was really palpable. Students don't think in these terms. And, and, but to Lundquist, this is how we should think of what education is. It's not something we bracket off in places. And so it's really important for us to recognize that while it's valuable to have gifted campus pastors, for example, Lundquist would fight against the sense that that's a distinct silo that does something apart from what we're doing in the classroom. And likewise, I think you'd say, well, it's probably good that in addition to prep, uh, professionalizing our faculty over the years, at professional student development, student life should not be in a silo either. But that is also related to what we're doing in the classroom, what happens in chapel. We should all really, or now new metaphor, these are cords woven together, not just three legs in the same stool. But it's hard to do that. You know, part of the nature of Bethel as an organization is that we've got people with expertise in different physical places with different responsibilities and they don't always talk to each other. And sometimes, in times of economic distress, they get jealous of each other and they fight with each other. And so I was struck last January by the fact that that didn't seem to be true of what we were doing off campus in our retreat from Bethel. I mean, in a certain sense, the first eight days were a lot like Bethel. It was in London and Oxford, but otherwise it was like Bethel. I mean, we would go to Trafalgar Square, or we would go to Whitehall, or we'd go to Hyde Park Corner, or we'd go to Magdalen College and visit the Quad, or we'd go to a garden by the Tate Britain, but we still would have class. For like two hours or three hours, we would talk about history, art history, we would talk about whatever we were doing, but then we would scatter, we'd go our separate ways. We might meet up at the hotel later, but basically we still had class. We had an interesting classroom, but it was class and was separate from the rest of the experience. 
And that was consciously designed to kind of usher us into the experience. But then we got on a train, crossed the channel, and went to the Western Front. And the weather got bad. And we got crammed together into small European minivans. And class stretched out for a whole day in small segments visiting different places. But you know, it, was, it was an all-day activity. And then in between, we'd have conversations about whatever. We were just in very close physical proximity to each other, getting bothered by each other, but also laughing at each other and you know, warning with each other. And, and we would eat supper together. And then we'd go to a hostel. And at least in one of them, we were the only group there, and they locked the doors behind us. And we were just there together. And, and so you could just feel these boundaries between academics, residential or student life, and even campus ministries disappearing. And the culmination for me was our first Sunday on the continent. We were visiting sites related to the Battle of the Somme, which kills hundreds of thousands of British, French, and German soldiers in 1916 um, around the city of Albert, which is where we stayed. And so we had spent most of the time, you know, first of all, just very sacred places. We were doing class, but we were doing it in holy spaces, like cemeteries and memorials that sacralized just by their very design. And then we had asked our guide, can you find us a church at the end? Because Sam and I thought we should do communion as part of this. And it's actually important, maybe, to have that kind of liturgy. And there's a basilica in Albert. It's called the Basilica Notre Dame de Bavière. Um, this is what it looks like now. It got rebuilt after the war. During the war, of course, it was shelled. This is what it looked like in 1916. It was called the Leaning Virgin. British troops would march off to the Somme to their death, and the Virgin would be blessing them. And then the Germans retook it, and the British actually destroyed the rest of the cathedral, so it can be used as an observation post. And so we're in this place, thinking about this history. So in a sense, we were in not only a living faith community, but in a memorial. And we were thinking about the death that had taken place in this place, the people who had marched past this place, who had gone to mass in this place, who went off to die. And then we broke bread together, and we prayed together, we worshiped together. It, it, was, it was maybe the most powerful educational experience I, I've had. And precisely because it so clearly touched the whole person. You could not put up any boundary to say that this is only my mind being affected here. This is only my heart. This is only my spirit. And it, it made it hard then to come back to a place where all of a sudden I've got them for seven minutes doing class. And I prayed at the beginning of it. I was reminded that there are different things happening here and we do silo those things. So that's all I'll say about this because I think this will be a theme that later speakers will come back to. I think you know, Kathy might touch on this as she talks about how you build the classroom as a community and what holy, holy persons really means. But I wanted to mention that maybe there's something about this space of off-campus study that retreats from the structures we've built up and professionalized educational institutions like this that conduces better to whole person education. And then there's the kind of, David calls this the politics of pietism, which he really means in the Greek sense. How do you do life together? How do you treat each other? How do you organize? And the pietists uh, often talk about the ecclesiola in ecclesia, the little church within the church, capital C, or the church, the denomination. Um, most pietists, unless they become Anabaptists or Baptists and become free church sectarians, most pietists do not found churches or denominations. Um, instead, the idea is that you renew existing ecclesial structures. And you do it by not rejecting the kind of Sunday morning sacramental and worshipful life. You still do that. But then also you do separate, smaller, more immediate, more intimate experiences that are not necessarily better. It's not that they're more truly Christian, what happens on Sunday, but that they permit different kinds of things to happen. And that's the ecclesiola. It's this little church within the church that renews the bigger church. Um, Harry Yide is a sociologist who's written about this in German Pietism. He identified five kind of hallmarks of the Ecclesiola. And I think there's some relevance here for education. First, it focuses on the organization and practice of the existing church and defining the need for renewal. It does not replace the church, it supplements it. It organizes around specific functions, so Bible study, devotional life, missions, service to the community. Um, usually those regarded as most crucial to the renewal of the practice of a larger church. It manifests interests in phenomena of renewal or modernization not linked to the specifically religious situation. Again, there's a degree of um, borderlessness to what they do. It's often more inclusive than that of the church body in which it originates, at least in practice. Schweiner's original uh, Collegia Pietatis included not just Lutherans like himself, but Reformed Christians, and even Roman Catholics. It was remarkable 25 years after the Thirty Years' War. Um, and finally, it often conjoins this churchly universalism with an impulse to transform the world. So you renew the church, but through that, we are world changers. Um, 
Um, another person who writes about this is a Wesleyan theologian, Howard Albert Snyder, who in the late, early 80s was very interested in church renewal. And he did his dissertation at Notre Dame on pietism, Moravianism, and John Wesley Methodism. And here's how he defined the ecclesial realm. It's a smaller, more intimate expression of the church within the church. It sees itself not as the true church in an exclusive sense, but as a form of the church, which is necessary for the life of the larger church, which in turn needs the larger church in order to be complete. It understands itself as necessary not merely because of a perceived lack in the larger church, but because of a conviction that the Christian faith can be fully experienced only in some such sub-ecclesial or small church form. There are important ways in which simply going to take part in that sacramental life on Sunday morning is not the full expression of following Christ, and that maybe you've got to do this in smaller communities. Um, I think the instinct here that David will be developing more is that pietism has this built-in anti-institutionalism, and it comes from kind of its Christian primitivism, this yearning to go back to the days of the apostles. It's also a sense that pietism is also about authenticity. A Christian experience is not simply conforming to social and cultural pressure or to political advantage. It's not going through the motions. It's not even intellectual assent to the words being spoken by a priest or a pastor on Sunday morning. And so where do you find that authenticity? And where do you break from the kind of um, ossifying, increasingly rigid structures that Christians tend to build up to make church? Well, maybe you've got to found these creative spaces called ecclesiola. It's a way not to destroy that church and replace it, but to disrupt it and to maybe uh, renew it. And this is, I think, what Lundquist, even more broadly than education, was picking up on. So he wrote in the sabbatical report, it seems to me that the relationship with the parachurch movement, and think of this as something, you know, not replacing the church, but a supplement. The parachurch movement to the local church is much the same as the retreat center is to the Christian campus. It can supplement, <coughs> supplement it by doing some things the church cannot do as well, and it can enrich it by experimenting with new ministries that may later be adopted by the church. <coughs> as the renewal movement does both, it can well be a spiritual catalyst for the whole church. Now, Lindquist does not just mean pietist small groups or Methodist cell groups or something. He, he is appealing to a larger tradition, monasticism, to medieval confraternities and communities. But all of these do put the sense that you don't replace the church, but you've got to find smaller, more intimate, more authentic places that supplement and enrich through experimenting the rest of the church. <clears throat> and I think this has obvious implications for education. I mean, you can take this ecclesiola and ecclesia model and kind of develop it with self-similarity across scale for higher education. Um, so I think Lundquist, in one sense, thinks that the college itself is like an ecclesiola in relation to its denomination. That um, Bethel exists, at least in his day, vis-a-vis -vis the Baptist General Conference to supplement it, you know, to do things that the churches cannot do themselves, like train pastors and missionaries, or to train people to be that task force for penetrating society that he talked about all the time. But it also enriches it because the college is a freer place than the church to push the edges of Christian belief and practice. And he actually said it's supposed to test those boundaries. It is supposed to actually push back against the denomination for the sake of the denomination. So in a sense, the college is like Ecclesiola. But the problem is that also ossifies. And, and pietists in a college setting ought to be really careful about the sense, how do we create structures that create dead orthodoxy? That, that rob us of that authentic Christian experience. And so maybe there needs to be ecclesiola within this ecclesia as well. And maybe that's what retreats help to do, and maybe what off-campus study can do. So he writes that uh, it supplements, but as an experimenting agency, the renewal groups are able to respond quickly to new needs as they arise. They have their ear tuned where people hurt more than to what bureaucracies have prioritized. They can afford to try new forms with less risk. It seems to me that these groups ought to be encouraged to experiment on behalf of the whole church. And I feel like this is what we do by giving faculty freedom to say, leave this place and go teach, and we'll give you credit for it. Um, or by giving students the freedom to go to a place like Oregon Extension or wherever they're going. That we're releasing them. You know, it ties to our curriculum. You know, it has a relation to faculty who have gone through a certain process to say they should teach at a place like Bethel. But there's a great deal of autonomy in those experiences. I think permits a great deal of creativity. And I think it does feedback. I think I'm a better teacher for having taught off campus because it forced me to think differently about teaching. And I hope that in ways I can't always perceive, enriching what I do in the kind of regular classroom. And you know, 
here, I hope I'll leave enough time for you to suggest if I'm on the right track, if you've had versions of this. But let me close by suggesting that while I think this is important, this is one reason why we continue to invest in off-campus and encourage students to do it, I also would hope this maybe has implications for this campus as well. So, implications for on-campus. First of all, go back to the, the retreat ideal. Are there things we can do here within the kind of structures that we no doubt need in order to be accredited and to do what we do? Can we interrupt our normal patterns? Can we disrupt conventional pieties without going to the deserts? Or metaphorically, are there deserts that we have around here that we should, we should be sending our students to? Um, in June, Roger Olson was the other speaker we brought back, the theology professor, and he said that Truth Seminary at Baylor, he has one class where they never meet in the same place. That's his way of disrupting it, is there is not just assigned seats, but there's not even assigned room. We go different places on campus all the time so that you don't settle into a pattern, even with the physical place that you inhabit for teaching. And I don't know that's a great idea, and registrars, if they're not here, they're probably cringing, it's where they are across Kresge, but that's what Roger does. Um, and then if we're a pietist college, more specifically, can we achieve full person rule without departmentalizing academics? Um, I don't, I, I think there's value to specialization of labor. I think there are things that residence life staff can do that I can't do. I think there's something Laurel Bunker can do that I can't do. But there are enough experiences around here that because they're unusual, convince me that we're missing something. Like Wayne Rosa talking in Convocation Chapel. Look at the schedule right now and see how many faculty from Bethel are talking in chapel in the coming weeks. There's something about that that we've lost, I think. We do not bring faculty in to speak beyond their fields of expertise. Um, I think of how few conversations I've had with anyone's student life about what we do with like CWC, which is this classic first year experience that 70% of Bethel students do. But I have had one. For a couple of years, I had this regular coffee appointment with a resident director, with Bill Byers, who's interested in history, but he also wants to know, what are you doing in CWC? Can you do programming in like, Edgren that would align with this and reinforce what you're doing and, and vice versa? So I think there are versions of that, that that help remind us that we have lost something by building those silos. And then finally, what are our ecclesiology here on campus? We do eat. We'll continue sending people outside, and that's probably useful. Are there experimenting agencies that, for the sake of the institution, our institution can grant? You know, I think about, you know, this is a different way to think about departments, in a sense, or divisions. But certainly it's a way to think about programs that are kind of freestanding, like CWC and Humanities. I can think that J-Term, this was kind of, to me, the founding impulse of J-Term, this intentionally innovative space. Well, it's tied to the curriculum and to majors, but it's meant to be intentionally different. I wonder if summer can be kind of like that. So I would hope, you know, that first of all, these are all hard things to do in general. You know, we, we have a lot of instincts towards institutionalizing these five against and standardizing. They're even harder to do in our current economic climate. Um, this does not fit things that value education in terms of economic utility. And anything that talks about faculty being more productive, more efficient, this is completely inefficient, non-productive kind of work. And so I understand this is maybe a cool to suggest these things, but precisely because it is, we should think about it. Um, this is hard to do. We have entrenched interests, and faculty are as bad at this as anyone else. But there, I mean, it's very hard to do this, and we struggle at it, and we need to find ways to overcome it. And this is hard as I look at a couple of means to say faculty be free to do this and be disruptive. That, that's very hard to do as well. I understand. So, as, as usual, our dreams, these are metaphors and poetry. I have no good advice to give. I thought I'd throw it out there to see if I'm on the right track. And I've actually left five minutes for questions or comments, which is my main goal for today. Uh, any thought, am I on the right track? People who've taught off campus? I mean, is this the whole person thing, the retreat thing, the like experimental agency thing? Um. As someone who both studied abroad and has listened to a lot of the study abroad presentations here, I think it's true, but I think one of the hard things is when they come back, they've had this experience and they feel slightly isolated because it's just one person who had this little ephesiola. So how do we build that up to kind of, I mean, coming to the study abroad experience, you can see someone who went to two different, they're nodding at this person because they relate, but they, that's just one opportunity. So I do wonder how we can build that into something a little bit bigger in Bethel. I mean, and I think there, I mean, there's the problem. I, I mean, the Ecclesiola thing that the idea is talking about is response to Ernest Trelch, who suggests that, you know, five don't do church, but they do sect instead. And this is a middle way, so that you don't minimize the church, but you don't privilege the sect. Um, the problem is you can get this idea that the Ecclesiola is the real church, though. 
that's the real educational experience is when you're gone, and that makes it really hard to reintegrate back into life, the community, and it creates all sorts of social tensions, I think. So I, I think that pattern is there as well for what we're doing. Ah, I completely persuaded you, and you have nothing to say. This is, this is wonderful. I'll look for the... Uh, Can I take the uh, issue with your last comment about it being completely un unproductive? You were saying that uh, some of the things that we would like to do, you're, you must be thinking of a way of defining product productivity there. I am. I'm thinking of the um, definition coming from the business world of productivity. All right. No, I, I mean, I think what we're doing is, of course, incorrect. I mean, that's renewal itself is productive. I mean, I, right. I just think it's, it's also very expensive because it's probably done in smaller groups. It's probably can't happen in a group of 100 with one professor. And at the same time, that renewal, I think there's something to be learned from Spectrum in the fact that uh, that was a program that had a purpose in terms of retention, if you want to deal with the business model. It also had to do with renewal of faculty who were like Carl, um, tired, beaten down. It was uh, the third year of the economic downturn in the 80s. So I think there, it, it can be revitalizing, which, if you really want to use the business model, is makes faculty get over their burnout and be able to be more productive. I so. agree. And come back on the 29th for Kathy to yeah. elaborate and everything. Yeah. 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 And I'm not going to say anything the next about that. <laughs> I think in a way, Bethel has supported little deserts on our campus in the form of laboratory. The laboratories are properly done, they become that getaway experience where you put a person in a very uncomfortable situation and let them grow and uh, be converted properly to uh, their discipline. But they should be uncomfortable situations, they should not, if possible, not be uh, cookie cutter uh, situations. And in fact, I think you could say nationally in terms of support, like from NSF, they're more interested in funding the desert situation than traditional academia. And uh, we've had some success with that. Glad you came to I was hoping you'd say something. Yeah, I mean, I think it's true. This is not just a curricular. I think it's each, each discipline probably has its own way of doing it. It's not really different by discipline. I, mean, I, I, do, I did think about the laboratory because they used the word experimental several times. There's something about that that there is no pattern. You're just talking, you're constantly tinkering, and you don't know what you're going to find. Maybe one more. Well, I, I think just piggybacking on that, it reminds me of um, the, the summer research community that sort of developed here. Um, sort of Adam Johnson and some others have brought students on campus together to sort of share what they're learning with each other. And that's really exciting to hear about sort of the research they're doing, but they're also coming together to sort of share experiences. And that's an interesting, I mean, I guess the word community comes to mind as well. Sort of what, what are these communities of practice or of interest with each other? And, and that's just kind of a neat example. And I, I wonder if, I bet we would find a lot if we actually just started looking around more with this framework, which is helpful. I, I think it is really sort of counterintuitive, but I think in many ways this is a distinctive that could help sell Bethel rather than something that we put underground. I, I was just at a homecoming event, a book signing with my little children's book, and right next to me was a young woman two years out of college. She got done in two and a half years, and so she's written a book about how to graduate from college in two and a half years. Oh. And I'm just <laughs> bristling as I sit there, and it's like, well, there goes my job. And it's like, and it's all these tips for students and parents about how to get out of college, you know. And so I got into it, of course, I couldn't resist, you know, it's like, oh, well, I, I'm always telling students life is long, you know, like, don't rush this, but may, can we, maybe this is trying to institutionalize something that shouldn't be institutionalized, but, this is like something unique about Bethel that we, it's a great selling point. And rather than buying into kind of the cultural norm of, you know, get out quickly, cut costs, do this, you know, it's like we're, we're selling something way beyond just just a degree. And I think we've lost that. We've, we've really, we've kind of given up something to the marketplace that I, 
I hate to see us lose, but I just would reiterate what Kathy was saying about it's also re restorative to faculty. I mean, because it's when you when you, when you get to operate as a whole person, that infuses you with life, and then you can give life to other people much more readily. Now, if you will ask for executive teaching actual class. <laughs> <laughs>